What's up, fam? Welcome back. Hey, everybody. Welcome to church. My name is Justin. This is Preston, and we are going to be your host for today. Hey, we got a great episode ahead and a great week ahead. Uh, we do. We've got Good Friday and Easter services coming up. We yep. want to make sure that you know how to join us for those. Uh, Good Friday is happening right here on YouTube, 7 o'clock. All of our pastors are going to be together for a live experience. We've got a special night planned where we remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. Uh, so we're going to have some time of reflection. We're going to sing a few songs together, and then we're going to take communion. It's going to be a great night. And it's going to be really special to be able to celebrate that together. And then, of course, Sunday is Easter Sunday. And spoiler alert, uh, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And it's going to be a great day. Um, we would love for you to invite your family and friends to join us for Easter happening right here on YouTube. It's super simple to invite someone. All you got to do is grab the link and you can text it to them, DM them, message it to them, whatever. Uh, all that's going down right here on YouTube. It's the place to be. That's right. Now, maybe that was your experience today. Maybe somebody texted you and let you know about service. Maybe you were just scrolling and you saw the link and you clicked it. No matter how you got here, we are so glad you did. We are finishing out our Walk It, Talk It series. Hey, so many of you have been challenged and encouraged and sharing with us about how you're growing in your faith through this series. And we love hearing that. Yeah, we love hearing the feedback from you guys on how you're growing and what God's teaching you, especially during this series. And so we want to take an opportunity to do that right now. A chance for you to hit us up, give us some feedback, say hi. Uh, something we do every week is invite you to text in to check in. So come on, grab your phone. Let's all take a moment. Text in right now. Information's on the screen. And, and when you do that, we're able, our, all of our pastors are able to pray for you during the week by name. And listen, if it's your first time here, uh, we want to say welcome to Epic. And we'd love to know that you're here with us. When you text in for the first time, we're going to send you a t-shirt as our gift, our way of saying thank you for being with us today. So yeah, do that. If you're new, be sure to grab that shirt. Don't miss out on it. Yeah. Uh, we think church should be fun. We yeah. like to have fun each and every week. Uh, we also like to compete in a lot of things. So we do. Justin yeah. and I compete in almost everything you can think of. It's this basketball. Uh, we compete in cornhole. Uh, I'm always up for a challenge, man, whatever it is. We even compete in paper football. It's wild. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that happens as, as a part of our series finale is Justin likes to put me on the spot. And he's like, hey, what are the things that we've learned throughout the series? And so, Justin, I think it's my turn to cash in this week. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I'm ready to cash in. So I want to I want to see, can you can your walk match your talk. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm, I'm always up for a challenge. What you got? All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a family feud style, man. We're going to take it family feud style. Let's go. Well, hey guys, welcome to Walk It, Talk It Feud. <laughs> Preston, dude, I love the mustache. You are going full on Steve Harvey. Go big or go home, <laughs> Justin. Yes. Yeah, baby. I've always <laughs> wanted to be on a game show. This is, this is great. This is your chance. So here's what we're going to do for Walk It, Talk It Feud. We're going to play the lightning round. All right, so we're going to put 30 seconds on the clock. Uh, you, The clock will start as I finish the first question. Okay, you'll answer all the questions, and we'll see if you can match your walk and your talk. Okay. Justin, are you ready? I'm ready. 30 seconds on the clock. Name the tagline for the series, Walk It, Talk It. Are you who you say you are? In episode two, we learned this phrase often used in scripture for loving and respecting God. Fearing God or fear of God. In episode three, name the oxymoron that Kent taught us that should never be used to describe the follower of Jesus. Um, Christian atheist. Ah, um, lukewarm Christian. And in today's episode, we've asked everyone to be praying about participating in what? Easter offering. Yeah! <laughs> that was awesome. Yes, man. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Great thank job, you. Dustin. Well, and I, I appreciate being on your show, Steve Harvey. Thank you. <laughs> Steve, trying to be proud, man. Well, listen, in all seriousness, let me give you a moment to, to get your stuff together there. You might want to take that mustache off. In all seriousness, though, uh, uh, we have a great episode ahead. We got a great message coming up. But first, we want to take some time to talk about our Easter offering. Over the past few weeks, we've reminded you about praying about how you might participate in our Easter offering. It's one of two times a year where we ask our church to give above and beyond their regular giving because we know that great churches aren't built on the talents of a few, but on the sacrifices of many. And we know that we can go further together than we could ever go alone. Uh, so we want to give you that opportunity today. Uh, we try to make it as simple as possible for you to give. Uh, you can just text the information on the screen. Uh, if you're ready to give right now is a great time to do that. And, and as we have this, this time to give, uh, we just want to take a moment to reflect on all that God has done over the past 12 years of our church. Man, 
God has done so much across our city, impacted so many people's lives, way more than we could ever hoped or imagined. And sometimes it's hard to grasp the, the magnitude of all that God has done over the years. And so we wanted to show it to you in kind of a, a cool way. I got a map here of Philadelphia and wanted to share some of our story. Yeah, just over 12 years ago, our church launched in a movie theater in Maniunk. Uh, man, look at, <laughs> look at all those dots. Those dots represent people who are part of our Epic fam. And that location eventually became Epic Parkside, where I have the opportunity of serving uh, and getting to know so many people who uh, are being impacted uh, yeah. by what God's doing through our church. That's yeah. been so neat. After that, we launched Epic Center City with Pastor Will and uh, we, we wanted to take church to people wherever they were at and not just ex expect people to come to us. And then we ran out of seats in the, in the movie theater. So we opened up Epic Roxborough with Jake. And the cool thing about that is we always want to make sure we have room for more and more people. We never want to run out of room. Uh, and that was literally what was happening in Epic Center City. So we launched Epic Fairmount, yep. uh, which became Epic Northern Liberties led by Emily, uh, which continued to give us uh, a greater reach in our city. And then right before the pandemic, uh, 2019, we launched Epic King of Prussia to reach the entire suburban area up there. And um, you know, the cool thing about that is we, we recognized that in order to reach the city, it was gonna take people even beyond the city. It was gonna take all of us to really make a difference and, and to reach every person. And our greatest opportunity uh, for that mission of reaching every person came last year as the pandemic was shutting everything down. We opened up Epic Online, which gave us the opportunity to connect with so many of you, literally all across the country, uh, and continue to see you take steps to follow God with all that you are. And it's, it's really cool to see uh, all that God has done over the past 12 years. And something we've said uh, throughout the entire time is every one of those dots, look at them. Every one of those dots represents a name and every name has a story and every story matters to God. And hey, we're gonna fill this thing up with dots all over Philly and all over, all over the country of people that we're gonna introduce to, to life in Jesus. And we just wanna take a moment to pray together over that mission, over that vision and over whatever may be going, through, uh, going on in your life. We wanna pray over your dot, over your story, over your family. So come on, let's pray together. God, um, we thank you uh, for what you've done all across uh, the city and even across the nation. Uh, it's pretty cool. And I, I pray that you would continue to, to be at work with each and every person, um, every family represented on this map here. Um, I pray your grace in their life. I, I pray as they follow and trust you that your love and mercy would walk beside them, um, that they would see evidence of you all over their life. And, and I pray for our church today as we receive this Easter offering, as we look towards the future, God, that you would walk with us and help us to have greater impact all around the city. Um, for those that don't know you yet, I pray we'd have opportunity to introduce them to you and, and show them what a life with Jesus can look like. Um, I, God, I pray for families and marriages that will be restored. I pray for families that will be reunited. I, I pray for children that will know Jesus and, and have their life changed by him. God, I, I pray for people that will receive healing and financial provision and just fulfillment in their life because they've decided to trust in you. God, I pray that you would show up in our church in such a strong way. We're gonna do our part. We're gonna continue to be generous and give and serve and love our city. We're committed to that. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do your part. Um, we pray over our city. We pray over every single dot represented on these maps. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Hey, thanks for praying for us, Justin. Uh, man, we really do celebrate all that God has done over the past 12 plus years. Uh, and we do feel like we're just getting started. There's so much more to be done. That's why today matters. That's why your giving matters. It's an opportunity for more people to stack hands that we could see every person come to follow Jesus. Really big deal for us. And uh, it's, along the way, it's been a huge process of trust, of learning to trust God, to take God at his word and to find him to be faithful. Uh, and that's what we're gonna be talking about in today's message, uh, trusting God fully. So let's get to it. Hey, my name is Jake, I'm the pastor at Epic Roxborough, and today we're gonna wrap up our Walk It, Talk It message series. You know, if we're honest, I think all of us would say that there's some areas of our life where our talk is a little bit bigger than our walk. Great example, the words we use on our resumes. You know, we can get pretty creative describing our previous work experience. So let me just tell you about some jobs I had when I was younger. So first I worked in agricultural production optimization, which means that I picked strawberries by hand on a farm. Uh, then I was chief groundskeeper and environmental consultant, which means that I picked up the toys in my neighbor's yard and then I mowed his lawn for him. And then I was lead sanitation and hygiene manager, 
which means I worked in a dish room. So for all the people who have dish room worker on your resume, let us know in the comments and uh, thank you for your hygiene and sanitation management. So there's some subtle wordsmithing that we do and then there's flat out lying. And so in 2019, authorities uncovered this college admissions scandal called Operation Varsity Blues. Maybe you remember it. Uh, Netflix just came out with a documentary on it. So basically these rich and famous parents pay huge sums of money so that their kids can get these elevated test scores or so that the coach will say that they're some type of elite athlete. It's like if my parents paid the high school football coach to say I was an all-state offensive lineman. I can just picture that college admissions interview and you're sitting there with the admissions officer and they're like, well, it says here you were a great offensive lineman. I wouldn't have guessed that, but that's what it says on the application, so it must be true. Well, the scheme wasn't covered. It was a huge embarrassment for everybody involved. Nobody wants to be known as a fake. I think we all want people to look at us and say, yeah, yeah, their, their walk matches their talk. And that's what this series is all about. For those of us who say that we're followers of Jesus, we're just doing a check-in to make sure that we're really living it out. And if you're with us and you wouldn't say you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you're, you're curious, maybe you're skeptical, maybe you've been outright put off by things that have done under the banner of following Jesus or Christianity, and we're really glad you're here because this is your opportunity to kind of hear what following Jesus is really supposed to look like, regardless of what you've experienced in the past. I mean, my hope is that as you investigate this with us, that you'll decide that you also want to start to pursue that along with us. So today we're going to talk about how we say we believe in God, but we don't really trust him. I mean, I believe in God. I may even believe that Jesus died to bring me forgiveness, but I don't trust him with every area of my life. Okay, so, so what's the difference between believing God and fully trusting him? Let me tell you about Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was a tightrope walker, a really good one. In 1859, he was the first person ever to cross over Niagara Falls 1,100 feet on a tightrope. Crazy. And he didn't do it just once, he did it over and over and he kind of made a show out of it. He did it once blindfolded. He did it in a sack. He did it on stilts. In his most famous crossing, he put a stove and supplies on his back, walked to the middle of the tightrope over Niagara Falls, built a fire and cooked an omelet. Are you kidding me? Like the crowds loved it. There's nothing it seemed like he couldn't do once when he was pushing a wheelbarrow across on the tightrope with a stack of potatoes on it he got done one of the guys who was watching it's like man you're great he's like hey do you think i could put a person in the wheelbarrow and cross he's like of course you're awesome he's like great hop in and all of a sudden he wasn't so sure right he's like i, I don't think so and i don't blame him and that's one misstep and that's a really rough swim so He's there, he's like, no, I'm not gonna do it. And that explains the difference between believing and trusting. The man in the audience believed that Blondin could push a guy in a wheelbarrow across the tightrope, just not this guy. So he believed, but he didn't really trust. And I think it's easy for us to do the same thing with God. I know that I do. I mean, sure, I believe that God provides for our needs, but I still get worried about these expenses that are coming up. Or I believe that God gives us wisdom when we ask him, but I still get stressed out by big decisions that I have to make. I believe the right things in my head, but those beliefs don't necessarily affect my life the way that God wants them to. Because I believe, but I don't necessarily trust. You see, trust is how you practically and personally apply what you believe. It's more than just saying you trust someone. It's actually living it out. And when it comes to my life and my future and my hopes and dreams, it's just really hard to trust. Isn't it true? Whether it's money or relationships or your health or your career or your past or your future, whether it's your parents or your kids, fully trusting God just doesn't come naturally. None of us trust God as much as we could. We've all got a ways to go, so, so don't be discouraged. But if we can get a vision for the life of trust that God is inviting us into, 
then we can start to take steps towards that goal. So here's what we're gonna do with the rest of our time here. We're gonna talk about some things that Jesus said about trust. And then we're gonna kind of take a look at some of those areas of our lives that are hard to trust him in. All right, so let's get started. For context, Jesus makes his first statement right after Peter acknowledges that he believes Jesus is the Messiah. He's the savior of the world. So Peter has big belief. And then Jesus responds to that in a way that's a little bit surprising. He goes straight from receiving that affirmation to saying, hey, listen, I'm gonna have to suffer, be killed, and then I'll rise again. Hey, sorry, I should have made a spoiler alert for Easter next week. But anyway, um, Jesus isn't holding anything back at this point. He's revealing God's master plan for bringing us forgiveness. And then Jesus goes on to say this, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be like me, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whatever loses their life for my sake will save it. Yikes, that's some real talk. All right, so let's recap what happened. Peter makes known what is the, called the, the great confession. He tells Jesus, I absolutely believe you're the savior of the world. And in response, Jesus reveals that his identity, being the savior of the world, doesn't mean that things are gonna be smooth sailing. Actually, the opposite is true. He says that God's plan for his life is actually for him to lose his life. And then he says, if you're gonna be on my team, you have to be willing to do the same. He says we need to die to our rights to stay in control of our lives. Instead, we need to completely follow his lead. He says, if you wanna follow me, come on, man, hop in the wheelbarrow. You gotta trust me. As soon as Peter says, I believe, Jesus says, great, now put that belief into practice and trust me. And as soon as you and I say, I believe, he tells us the same thing. The belief that we read about in scripture isn't some academic, all in your head type of belief. It's this active response of complete surrender to God. And so if we believe something as grand as Jesus is the savior of the world, and that has to have ramifications for how we trust him in every area of our lives. Now I know that when we hear that, it feels like, whoa, like Jesus, you are asking too much of us. Like that is too much to expect. But here's what I want us to see. It's not that God is asking so much of us. It's that God wants so much for us. Our tendency is to think that we have to trust God. If we, if we have to trust God, then I'm just gonna always be worried. But we have it backwards. Like trusting God doesn't add to our worry, it eliminates worry. If you really trust God, it's freedom from worry. And here's why because you weren't meant to carry the weight of your future on your own. You weren't meant to carry the weight of all the uncertainties of life that we face each and every day. You were meant to trust your heavenly father so that he can give to you his supernatural peace. And this isn't just something for the spiritually elite. It's God's plan for all of us. So take a listen to what Jesus had to say about trust and picture him speaking directly to you. He said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. And you can substitute in there any of the things that you need. Is not life more than food? The body more than clothes? Like look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? What a humbling question. No, we can't add anything of value by worrying. I mean, but we can add stress and fear and health problems. So worry can add a lot of things, but none of them are helpful. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Did I tell you that not even Solomon, that's King Solomon, super rich dude, and all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, oh, you of little faith? 
So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans, those who don't know God, they run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What a comforting thought. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. He is not unaware or indifferent towards the the details of your life that you're running after and fretting over. He knows. And so in light of all that he said, Jesus tells us what we should do instead of worrying. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ain't that the truth? Jesus says, you got a choice to make. You can either worry about your life and run around trying to make sure everything works exactly the way that you want it to, even though you can't make that happen, or you can surrender your life to me and just pursue my purposes and becoming like me. And if you'll do that, you can rest well at night because I'm gonna take care of you. And so that, that's your choice. Like Pastor Kent said a couple weeks ago, God takes full responsibility for the life that's wholly devoted to him. So when you first hear that God wants you to trust him, man, it sounds like, oh, you want so much from me. But it's not true. It's that he wants so much for us. And once we understand the love and the care that he has for us, the power that he offers to us, man, you realize he wants for you something you could never get on your own, a freedom and a peace that is unlike anything else you could find. So how do we get there? Well, learning to trust, it takes some gut level honesty. So let's just talk about some of those areas of our lives where it's honestly, it's just really hard to trust God. One of them is money. And if your first reaction is, oh man, why we gotta talk about that? Uh, I think that our aversion to talking about it gives us a pretty good clue. Because very few things fight for our trust like our money. And that's why Jesus spoke so very pointedly about it. He said this, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now I used to hear that and be confused by it because I I thought to myself like, man, if I love God, why does it mean I have to hate money? I mean, just because I like to eat and live indoors doesn't mean I can't love God too, right? But the point here is that He's saying if if you love God as your master, then you hate the idea of serving money as your master. You'd be like, no, that will not be my master. On the flip side, if if the pursuit of money is what drives your life, then you'll hate the idea of surrendering to God because you know that the two are in conflict with each other. Money isn't a bad thing. It can do a lot of good. I mean, it makes a great servant. It's just a terrible master. You and I need to be intentionally choosing to trust God instead of our money, no matter how big or small our paycheck might be. And one of the most helpful instructions that God gives us is to be generous, because it makes sure that money stays a really useful servant and never weasels its way to become our master. Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he said that on the first day of every week, you should take and set aside a part of your income to dedicate towards God's purposes. And then he also says you should be generous about it. Why? Two reasons. One, because there's some really important work that needs to be done and it takes money. And two, when you're generous, it makes sure that money is always your servant and it's never your master. If we're walking what we're talking, it'll be obvious by how we manage our money. The heart of Christian belief is that Jesus died and rose again so that anyone who believes in him can be forgiven and have eternal life. Man, there's nothing that is more important. Nothing even compares to that message. So if we really believe that, it should compel us to invest in things that last for eternity. And when we do that, we overcome the temptation to worry and we reject the lie that God won't provide for our needs. So learning to be generous is a super important way that we learn how to trust. So another big area that's hard to trust God in is romantic relationships. I know, I know. Can we just go back to talking about money? 
Yeah, this is a really hard and personal topic, and that's exactly why we need to ask ourselves, am I, am I really trusting God in this area? Man, if you're single, I know that finding Mr. or Mrs. Wright can be like so consuming. It can be hard to even know what it looks like to trust God in this area of life. And I'm not gonna pretend to know half of the pressures associated with dating in 2021. But what I wanna do is I wanna give you a couple principles to guide you as you trust God in this important area. The first principle to realize is that God designed sex to be enjoyed exclusively within the context of marriage. I realize that this is countercultural. It might sound unrealistic to you, but what if God created that boundary, not because he's a cosmic killjoy, but because he knows that if we violate his design, there'll be consequences. You know, sex before marriage can, can lead to unnecessary hurt and it can hinder God's best for us, which really is exclusive intimacy with a lifelong spouse. I think that one reason that people abandon God's design is because they hope that sex will give them that bond that they need to secure a lifetime partner, right? That happens sometimes. Like we, we meet that person, we think they might be the one, and then we, we hope that by having sex, we'll advance a relationship forward. But so often, the opposite is true. When a sexual relationship comes before a permanent commitment, and things get wonky. At the stage of your relationship when you should be focusing on that person's personality and, and learning and understanding their character and really getting known that way, we introduce this unnecessary distraction. When there's sexual connection, it just muddies the waters when we're trying to evaluate the relationship. So sex before marriage can hinder the clear and natural progression of your relationship, even if that person is the right one for you. And you know what? That's actually the best case scenario. Because the other alternative is things don't work out. And now you shared a part of yourself with someone who doesn't treasure you the way that your sexual partner should. And every time that that happens, it becomes an emotional barrier to the intimacy that you ultimately long for with your future spouse. It's counterproductive. So trusting God in your dating relationships means trusting God's design in this area for sex. It might be hard, it might seem inconvenient, but it's for our good. That's why God tells us that's the way that we should order our relationships. So man, I wanna challenge you, I wanna encourage you. If you haven't trusted God with this area up till now, it's not too late to start. You can start today. And God can heal the hurt from your past and broken relationships. But that first step is designing, I'm gonna trust God's design. The second principle for dating relationships is, is something that we've kind of already hit on. God says that if you seek first his priorities and becoming like him, then he'll take care of everything else. He'll meet every one of your needs. And there's nothing wrong with, with keeping an eye out and going out on dates, that's great. But if those things become the highest priority in your life, then, then things are out of balance. And just like Jesus said, you can't add an hour to your life by worrying. You cannot speed up his process for bringing your spouse into your life, you can't. So if you focus on what you can control, Serving God, becoming created like him and his character, becoming like him, man, then you, you'll prepare yourself to be the partner you need to be when he ultimately brings that person into your life. And you know, just because you get married doesn't mean that trusting God in your relationships is done. And the, the, the party's just getting started. And so um, I think that one of the best things that you can do in your marriage to show that you're trusting God is to pray for your spouse. And so if you spend more time complaining or nagging than praying, that's a sign that you are not trusting God in your marriage. And you know, if, you're, if your partner is also a follower of Jesus, man, it's so helpful. Or even if they're just willing to do this, you wanna pray together regularly. I think that sometimes what we do is we, we look at prayer as like that, that last effort, the last thing you do after you've tried everything else, rather than making it a, a regular practice to keep God at the center. Man, when we do that, we say, God, I'm trusting you because marriage is too hard to do on our own. We need to invite God into it. All right, so, so money and relationships are, are two big areas where we struggle to trust God, but of course, they, they are not the only ones. Uh, maybe you worry about the future, you worry about school or jobs and career, or maybe you worry about your health or you worry about a family member, or maybe for you, you're dealing with worry in some area we haven't even mentioned. Whatever it is that you're not trusting God with in this season, man, I hope, 
I hope you'll take the step and start to surrender control to him. Because complete trust is a, an amazing and beautiful thing. You know what it reminds me of is uh, when we get to see these ice skating pairs on the Winter Olympics. And they're, they're flying around the ice, they're fully trusting each other, they're in sync with each other, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's also kind of insane when you think about it. They're basically taking two knives and fastening them to the bottom of their feet, whipping around, jumping around this ice, which is as hard as concrete. You know, you see this guy, he's throwing his partner 12 feet up in the air. She's like laying parallel with the ice, just relaxed without a care in the world, fully trusting that he's gonna catch her when she comes down. Or he's whipping around by the hand. Um, her, her head is just inches from the ice and she's just like, okay with that. Uh, by the way, that move is called the death spiral. And a word to the wise, any move that has the word death in it, you should just probably stay away from. Or check out this picture. Man, if I'm that lady, I'm like, buddy, you better be a lot stronger than you look. I watch these ice skating pairs, and I'm just amazed the trust between them and how they move together. And then they show a segment while you're watching the Olympics, and they tell you that, that these guys, they've been together for five years, they've been practicing eight hours a day, every day, and that's how they develop this trust. It's not like the first time they meet, he's like, hi, I'm Bob, I'm an ice skater. She's like, oh, I'm Sue, I am too. Good to meet you, Sue. Would you mind if I just threw you up in the air? I'll catch you. Sure, that'd be great. And when you're done, could you hold me upside down by my ankle? Like, it doesn't work like that. You know, it starts with them getting to know each other, and they go out and they skate around the rink the first time, and, and then they, they learn to skate and sink, and then they start to build trust. She lets him swing him around, her around a little bit, then a little faster, and then over time, Sue learns that Bob can be trusted. And every time that he doesn't let go of her hand, every time that he catches her falling out of the sky, every time he says, oh, I can trust Bob. And after years of their trust growing, we get to see them out on the ice. They're together doing things that defy logic in the way that they trust each other. And that's the way it is with trusting Jesus. After we come to believe that he's the son of God, and we decide to make him our forgiver and the leader of our life. We're adopted as his child. We're a child of God. But just because that's true doesn't mean that we know how to trust him in every area yet. We have to first learn about him. We have to learn about what his plan is, what his promises are to us. And after we learn to trust him in one area, then we're challenged to trust him in another area, and then another area. And through every challenge, through every trial that we see that, that we can trust him, our faith grows. And the next time that we realize I need to trust him in this area, it becomes a little bit more natural. And over time, as we focus on building his kingdom and being shaped into his image, we realize something. You know what? I don't need to worry about the things that everybody else in the world is worrying about. Because God's not going to drop me. I can trust him. So that's the kind of trust that we need to get to. How do we start? One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Apostle Paul wrote this. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. What a command. What should we do instead? But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Man, when I feel worried, which is a lot, when I want so badly to do things my way and just to grab the wheel and take control, what I'm learning is I need to stop and pray and give it to God. You may have noticed an interesting ingredient in that passage. He says that we should include thanksgiving, and here's why. See, when I, when I thank God for being a loving father who promises to meet every need that I have, when I put him first and put his things first, well, then it positions me to receive his peace and it transcends my understanding. So when I thank him, I remind him of what I know about him. So whatever it is that you realize you're not trusting God with, the very first step you can take is to pray. Because ultimately, trust requires surrendering to God. And so to close out our service today, we're gonna to sing a song called Surrender. It was actually written by Epic MSC. And the first few lines of the song say, Lord, if you don't lead me, 
where will I go? Your spirit brings stillness and steadies my soul. So now I reach for you just as I am. Lord, I surrender. Man, I wanna encourage you to make this song a prayer of surrender for that area of your life where you're not completely trusting God. Remember, it's a process. Completely trusting God doesn't happen overnight, but it does start in a moment. So I encourage you to take this opportunity and begin the journey right now as we sing. Lord, if you don't lead me, where will I go? Your spirit brings stillness and steadies my soul. So now I reach for you just as I am. Lord, I surrender, surrender. I've run my course. I've come. Hurt, shame, and fear Whisper that there's no one else I've run my course I've come to the end of myself
What a powerful song about surrendering and, and trusting God. And a great message from Jake. Uh, he, he taught us, I wrote this down. Trust is how you practically and personally apply what you believe. Good stuff, Jake. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, one of the areas that we talked about trusting in uh, before the message was in generosity with our Easter offering. And we want to invite you, if you haven't had a chance to give yet, uh, to help us build the future, to get in on that. Yeah, and if you haven't already, be sure to text in to check in. It's an opportunity yeah. for us as pastors to care for you this week. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love yeah. to be praying for you. So be sure uh, to do that. And one of the things about this series that I've loved is how we're highlighting somebody who's walking the walk, right? Who's yeah. trusting God yeah. uh, with their lives. And today is no exception. Uh, we get to highlight someone who's a pediatric ER physician, somebody who's a mom, a wife, uh, two kids. Um, she's a part of Epic MSC, our band. She's part of our Epic Northern Liberties fam. Come on now. Now we're celebrating you, Lauren Von Holtz. Lauren works for CHOP, which if you're not from Philly, uh, means the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And she actually leads a project that connects families with the care and the community resources that they need. It's pretty cool. Uh, she's a mom, uh, a mother of two little ones, which is noteworthy in and of itself. Come on now. But every day she walks out her faith by advocating for other people and giving them the care and the medical attention that they need. So way to go, Lauren, your husband, JC, the work that you're doing across the city, and special shout out to all of our medical professionals, especially over the past year of the course of the pandemic. You guys are true heroes and incredible. Thank you for walking the talk, doing what you do. Lauren, you rock. Keep getting after it. So proud yep. of you being a part of our Epic fam. And we want to remind everybody about Good Friday and Easter coming up this weekend and make plans to attend. It's a great opportunity to invite some people to join you, friends, family, coworkers. Let them know what's going on. And before you go, uh, if you're new here, Pastor Kent wants to say what's up and invite you to our next welcome party. And one last thing. Preston, can we get that mustache again? Yeah, I mean, what <laughs> I want to see it. You guys vote. Should he grow it out or, or not? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Let me know. Mustache or no? Well, hey, thanks again for joining us for church today. If you're new, we're glad you're here. And I just want you to know we do church just like this online every single week. And we'd love for you to be a part. If you had a good time, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Instagram and we'll make sure we keep you in the loop. Listen, no matter who you are, we believe that God has an incredible plan for your life. We just want to do our part to help you discover what that is. So keep following along online and make sure you text the word here to the number on the screen so we can make it official, send you your t-shirt and get you all hooked up with everything you need to get connected and be part of the fam. In fact, I personally want to invite you to be one of our guests at the welcome party because we'd love the chance to get to meet you. Again, so glad you're here today. Text that number and we'll see you next week.